we're going to get ourselves into our seats. I'm just going to look at the tech people to say the mics are doing what they're supposed to be doing. I'm going to get a nod. Yeah, we're good with that. Good. So good morning. Good morning, Victoria. Good morning, everyone. My name is Oliver Brandis. I'm the co-director at the Polis Project and the associate director at the Center for Global Studies. I am so pleased, it's a real pleasure, to welcome you here today to Victoria. I'm so excited that we can gather and discuss this really important topic. But before we get started, as always, I want to start by acknowledging, with respect, <clears throat> the Lekwungen speaking people on whose traditional territory we gather today, the Songhees, the Squamalt, and Wasonic people whose historical relationship with land and specifically water, very apropos, continue uh, to this day. I also want to give a hearty uh, shout out and thank you to the many volunteers, organizers, especially uh, soft spot in my heart to the very special people at the Polis Project, led by Rolene, who's done a ton of the work. Um, there's so many more. We all know that events like this don't just happen, right? They take work and thought, and then more work. I also want to make sure that we're acknowledging and registering that we have a whole bunch of viewers out there in what was once called TV land, now the web land, watching, so that's great. And of course, uh, uh, the Canadian Water Resources Association has uh, been a big uh, co-host and partner, and we'll get some remarks from them as well. And finally, most importantly, of course, we want to thank all the organizers, volunteers, etc. But I want to thank you all, right, for making yourself available to come out to talk some water, talk some governance, talk about opportunities, talk about the future, how to think differently about some problems. Um, I especially want to make sure that we are going to think about this as a very inclusive and exciting dialogue. I'm just madly looking around for Bruce, just confirming he's here. Um, when we think about water, we can all recognize it as just such a simple substance, but when we think about the management or the governance, the watersheds, we recognize exactly how complex and the many challenges we face. We know that when water crosses boundaries among communities, between indigenous nations and their traditional territories, and even across international borders such as Canada and the US, all this add up to a massive, massive challenge. The complexity, that's what we're here to face today. So with no further ado, I want to once again welcome you on behalf of the University of Victoria, POLIS, and the Center for Global Studies here on our home, our campus here. And of course, to our key organizer with the Canadian Water Resources Association. And I'm going to pass off this uh, wonderful event to our Masters of Ceremony for the day, Bruce Maclock, who was really the uh, spark that lit the fire that we are going to burn today. Thank you. Thank you, Oliver. <clears throat> yeah, I should have made him Master of Ceremonies. He's <coughs> done very well so far. Um, right, my name is Bruce Maclock, as Oliver said, and uh, we have a kind of a, a long, busy, dense, speaker-ridden day. So um, I have a few administrative remarks that relate to how we'd like the day to unfold. But the first thing I'd like to do is, is ask David Murray, immediate past president of the Canadian Water Resource Association, to offer their greeting, because those folks stood behind us very firmly while we got this thing underway. So David, please. Thanks, Bruce. Good morning, everyone. And uh, I just want to welcome you on behalf of the Canadian Water Resources Association. And I bring uh, greetings from President Sean Douglas and the Cedar Beret Board, who are meeting at this moment. Our board meeting is at the same time of this event, uh, so unfortunately I won't be able to stay with you. Um, uh, this seems much more interesting than an all-day board meeting. <laughs> but uh, I just wanted to welcome you. And I also want to uh, uh, thank UVic's Polis Project as well. Uh, for collaborating with us uh, on this event. And it's also part of our national conference. And I hope that you're sticking around for that. It, uh, the national conference is entitled Our Common Water Future, Building Resist Resilience Through Innovation. Um, so we're gonna we just wanna thank everybody for being here, thank the speakers and their efforts and you for attending. 
And uh, you're going to learn a lot of things today, and, and I'm sure you have some differing views on things, and this is all part of what CWA does best, which is pulling together diverse groups, having a discussion, facilitating a discussion uh, on, on what the best course forward is. Um, CWA has been around since about 1948. Um, it might even be longer than Bruce, I'm not sure. So. <laughs> uh, but but uh, Bruce is a past president many years back. Um, so we have uh, lots of connections across the country. It's about 800 members across Canada. And we have branches in, in virtually every province. We have a board meeting today with members from, from each province. Um, we're nonpartisan, we're nonprofit, we're charity, um, and we facilitate discussion. So this is what the type of things we like to do. So we're really excited about this day, and it's an excellent program that's been put together. Um, CWA also has sustainability principles uh, for water management in Canada. And I'm just going to, I'm going to leave you today with a, a quote from, from our sustainability principles uh, right, right in our website. Water is a precious and finite natural entity which is essential to all life and vital to ecological, economic, social, and spiritual well-being. Yet water is often wasted and degraded. Therefore, uh, we face both individual and collective responsibilities to use and manage water wisely. So this will not only be accomplished as we recognize the intrinsic value of water, and we need to practice conscious and committed stewardship, uh, recognizing that this precious heritage must be safeguarded for future generations. And I think that statement is really embodied in what you're doing here today. So I'm going to wish you well on your symposium. Unfortunately, I can't stay with you uh, today. Um, but once again, welcome on behalf of Cedar Beret. Thank you very much, Dave. Before we get onto the substance of the conference, today's symposium, I'd like to ask elders May Sam to offer a greeting from the, her First Nation and a small prayer as appropriate. May. Where would you like to be? Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Aishka, thank you for being here this morning. Like many of us, we have so much to do in our life. There's family, and then work. And being here, you've committed yourself to come be here for the day to learn more the Columbia River Symposium. Aishka. My traditional name is Swits TCA. I'm from the Malahat First Nations where I was born. And uh, my English name is May Sam. And I love to tell the children my name is not April or June, it's May. And I just like to see them smile. And, and I tell them, you call me great grandma. That's OK. But you know how important it is for water? It's like I grew up by the Couching River in Duncan. And um, I had to, as a little child, I had to use two buckets to go and get water at the river. And by the time I packed it home, half of it was spilled out before I'd get home. And uh, it was hard work in those days. We had to pack water and put it in a tub and make, and my auntie would make fire to heat the, heat the water, to wash wool. And uh, we always had, dad had this big wooden barrel in the corner of the house, behind the house. And he'd always catch the rainwater so that when we were tired to go get water to do the dishes, 
we'd go and get a pan full and put it on the, on the cook stove. But we had to make fire. We didn't have electricity in our home. We didn't have plumbing in our home. So we had to get water, heat the water. And this was way back in, as far back as I can remember, early 1950s. So it's a real blessing for a raindrop. When that last summer, when that big, big fire was happening, and all our loved ones, people that were losing their home in that fire, I was praying for them. And I was looking at my dishwater, and I'd put it in a dishpan. And I often wondered what my neighbors thought of me. What is that crazy old lady doing now, you know? But I'd always take my water, my dishwater, I'd pack it outside, and I'd spill it out in my plum tree. I didn't want to waste that dishwater down the sink because it had, it was, made it, waited until it got cold had soap in there, so I made use of it, I recycled it, took it outside, even though it was hard work. But I, I loved to do that all summer last year because it was so hot. You know, the prayer I'm going to do today is for you. I'm going to say the prayer in my language. It's so important to ask the Creator for a blessing in our first language. My first language was Hulkamainam from Couchin. And I, I really love to say the prayer first to speak to the Creator. And I try to remember everything to translate it in English after. Sometimes I forget the most important part in English, but I want you to know that I did ask for the blessing for you your family, extended family. My prayers for my husband. He's going through, he, they dropped me off here. He's going to Jubilee for dialysis three days a week. So, and um, I'm here with you, but I'm sorry I have to leave. I'm with uh, 12 students from Squamalt today. They do house visits and they've been learning how to weave at my house. So today they're picking me up. I have to text them and tell them where I am. And they're taking me to a farm. So there I'm going to share my teachings with them at the farm today. You know, it's hard talking to young people today. They don't have it hard like we did, like I did when I was young. It, it gave me the backbone to stand up to be where I am today. The life and teachings, traditional teachings that I received from my loved ones. I didn't have a mom. She took off and left me when I was four months old. And my father was the greatest man ever. His name was Everest, and he was tall and handsome, just like the mountain I look at and I pray when I see the look at Mount Everest. He was the greatest person ever. And he took me way up the bush when he was falling trees. He'd climb the tree with his corkshoe and he'd run the belt and he'd cut every branch down and fall that tree. He'd holler at me, Nem Eli. He says, me, go away, go way up there. So we had to move away before the tree went down. Nowadays, if anything happened, anything like that, the welfare, human resources would take, take us away. I was really blessed and I was really lucky to be with my dad, the teachings I got from him. With his knitting after work, he'd knit. And uh, you look in um, couch and knitting, Maysam, in your computer, and you'll get a lot of information about a lot of things I've shared. And my daughter says, Mom, did you know you're on the 
Oh, oh, I forget what you call it. What do you call that anyway? That's got all that internet. internet. <laughs> And I, I didn't realize, you know, everything that our loved ones have shared that's in there. So I'm going to do my prayer. I'm supposed to be here to do my prayer. I always get carried away. I really get carried away in sharing a lot how precious water is. And I want to say hi, Chika. Hi, Chika. Thank you for listening to me. And I know you have a long day, but I pray that, that you're going to be able to be here for the whole day and really look at everything before you. Technology is so wonderful today. I don't want to learn anything about the computer. I'm far too busy. I can't learn the computer. I don't want to. I have my cell phone. I forgot to turn it off. I better turn it off before I do my prayer. And um, Yeah, OK now. So the prayer and the song is for you. Say hi. Punamak snask man, say Timanas, say T Saunders praise, Lord of Day. Masi, hi, Shlatitel CM, Tanai Nater. Hi, Shlatitel CM, Tana school out. E tina matulia, hai shkatito siem kus ni tu lalamati tzedzu at the mug, ai sili. The thies yais, mugs quayali, mugs nit, masi, tzichum. I praise and I thank the Creator for a beautiful morning. I ask the Creator for a blessing for each and every brother and sister here with us today that you're truly going to take care of them and watch over them and guide them and give them a helping hand in their heart. I praise and I thank you. And also to remember the ancestors that were here before us, to truly thank them and have them watch over you and take care of you. No harm is going to come before you in your stay here in the University of Victoria. And also to remember a blessing for the land that we walk on here in this wonderful territory. Look on and song he's Husainich Tamuh Squimal Song He's Sanich Territory. I praise and I thank you. A blessing for you and your immediate family. A blessing for each and every one of your loved ones to help them in each and every way. A blessing for all of you. And this song is for you to give you strength throughout the morning until all day and all night to help you. Aishka. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
I praise and I thank the Creator for a blessing. All the blessings you seek for flows through your heart. In your prayer, it reaches your loved ones that is in need, in deep need of a blessing today. And also a blessing for the students that come through these doors into this wonderful building. A helping hand for each and every one of the staff that come and do their daily work to take care of and help each and every one. Aishra, Aishra. Thank you again, May. <clears throat> um, I mentioned that I had a few housekeeping remarks. I'd just like to get straight into those. The, uh, um, I think you all know the washrooms are back to the, at the back of the building and, and as you came in. Uh, cough, there are two coffee breaks today, um, one at 10.30 and one in the middle of the afternoon. I'd like to thank uh, the province of British Columbia for sponsoring that first one. And I think it's the BC Real Estate Foundation sponsored the second one. Um, this, uh, as Dave Murray mentioned, this symposium was organized <clears throat> by um, a group of people, quite a collection, and it wouldn't have come off without the Oliver Brandis's uh, uh, group, the, the Polis group, and the CWRA staff in Ottawa, and, and some, uh, some local folks here too. <clears throat> We originally had it in mind to, to run the conference at, uh, in, or the symposium inside the CWRA conference downtown, but felt that the room here was <clears throat> much more suited, and so we came here. And thanks to Oliver being our host, we now have this room. <clears throat> this, today's endeavor, <clears throat> we'd like to underline, is a, a science and knowledge gathering endeavor, and. The, the, the small band of fertile criminal minds that put this together, four or five of us, really want to emphasize that we are not aligned with any particular viewpoint. <clears throat> we just want the science on the table. And so forgive us for organizing a pretty dense day with not a lot of questioning um, after each session, but <clears throat> we do have a, we want to hear from you folks, and we do have an hour set aside at the very end and hope that that can 
suffice as a, a, a question and answer discussion period. It, so we, you may feel a little bit crowded for time as we, try, as the moderators try and, if you like, move us along quickly. So forgive us for that. We discovered when we looked at the at the the, the whole realm of the Columbia River Treaty uh, renegotiation possibilities that there's an awful lot of stuff that has to be done, and so um, we only just hit the high points by persuading speakers like our first one sitting beside me, <clears throat> Barb Cousins from Idaho, to help us with this. So anyway, it's a long day, and please have patience with the moderators. Um, if you find you, uh, after one paper, that you don't have a question um, or don't have room in that five-minute period or so for a question, write your question down and give it to the moderator. And, and the questions um, can be written down on pieces of paper, index cards that Mike is holding there. And each moderator, the first moderator, for example, is John Reardon down on my right. In this first session, for example, take that your questions and give them to John and do the same in the next session and so on. The moderators will gather them all together and take a, take a look at them, see which ones are similar, and prioritize them a bit and get them ready for that last question and answer, period. This session is being recorded through some clever magic, uh, I'd say, webcasting technology, so the people, many people in the interior of BC or anybody that wanted to tune in could. And there is no inter, we're not able to offer internet access in this room today. I think that's about all I really want to do. I, I want to quickly as possible, it's nine o'clock, move to John and get on with the session. Have I missed anything, Mike? Oh yes. The Minister, Ministry of Energy Mines and Petroleum Resources for the province of British Columbia is a fundamental reason why we're able to get speakers to come. They have done a great deal in, in ponying up to pay for speaker travel. I'd like to thank them profusely and uh, move on. Okay, my first moderator is John O'Riordan, and he's going to introduce the first session. So can I ask uh, the speakers to uh, join me at the head table? I, I should mention off the bat, in case you get confused, that um, Rich Moy, who is the member of the American side of the IJC, and supposed to be speaking second in this panel, uh, unfortunately he was unable to be here today because he broke some ribs on the weekend and uh, wasn't able to drive from Montana to Victoria with broken ribs. But um, well, he and I had, have collaborated on a, a chapter in a book on the history of the IJC, which is being uh, coordinated by the uh, Murray Clemens of the Secretariat to the IJC. And that book is forthcoming and will be published in about approximately six months. And so he, Rich has asked me to present on his behalf. So I have the distinguished honour of being both moderator and speaker at the same panel, so it's... Uh, what a challenge. Anyway, I'd like to welcome my uh, panelists to the meeting. We're going to go straight to the talk so we can maximize the amount of time taken in presenting, um, and then we'll have a short uh, question period after each panelist. So the first one is uh, Bob Cousins, and I've known Bob now for about three or four years since I personally became involved in the Columbia and she was telling me last night that she has herself been extensively involved in the Columbia Treaty since I think about 2009. So she's one of, uh, she's written extensively on the treaty and probably the most well-versed on all of its nuances of any um, practicing academic that I know of. And she has the unique ability to speak for both the Canadian interests and the American interests. So she's totally bilingual. And without any ado, I'd like to invite Bob to make a presentation. Thank, 
Thank you. Thank you, John. I'd like to thank the, the organizers. This is a, a fabulous lineup for this gathering. I'd also like to acknowledge the Coast Salish as the original owners of this land. And also, since today in the US is Memorial Day, I would like to acknowledge all those who have given their lives for both of our countries over the years. Um, so, so my task today is to uh, give sort of the history of the treaty, the review process, and outline the issues that, that separate or, or at least appear to separate the US and Canada um, coming out of the regional review. We don't really know where they're at as they go into the negotiations, um, which start tomorrow. And, and so I'm gonna do all of that in uh, 15 to 20 minutes. So let's get going. So, So that's not in my forehead. There we go. Short people. Yeah, they didn't make podiums for us. Um, so the the treaty initially, both countries had asked the International Joint Commission to begin studying how the the two countries could have joint benefits from development of the Columbia River. But what really catalyzed it was a major flooding event in 1948. And in that year, the snowpack was about what it was this year. Um, and we saw flooding in the Okanagan this year, but not on the Columbia River. Um, and that's probably largely due to the dams. But also what happened in 1948 is you had a very rapid warming event in May and a rain on snow event. And what that does is brings all, all the snow melt off at once. And so um, just remember this number because I'll refer back to it. The estimated flow at the Dalles, which is, is the point they kind of use as a reference for measurement because it's downstream on the Columbia from where the major tributaries come in. Um, and, and it's along the border between Washington and Oregon. The flow estimated there was a million cubic feet per second. And a um, major community near Portland was wiped out, Vanport that the pictures here are of. There was major flooding in Trail, BC, and other communities within British Columbia, and that really catalyzed it. Nevertheless, it still took until 1964 when, when we finally had a treaty enter into force. And what they had decided is that there were two benefits that could be shared from development of the Columbia River, hydropower and flood control. And so in the treaty, there was agreement that three dams would be built in Canada, the three that are shown here. Uh, in between Micah and Keenly side, there is a re-regulating reservoir called Revelstoke. That's not a treaty dam, but it has to be operated consistent with the treaty. Uh, the, the treaty also allowed but did not require Libby Dam to be built in the US. It had, they had to have agreement to allow that because it backs water up into British Columbia. The United States paid Canada 65 million for what's called assured flood control for 60 years. So that's a very conservative operation of the river, use of dams in Canada to prevent flooding downstream in both British Columbia and in the United States. So 65 million for 60 years. Um, because the, the power that's produced from release of dams in Canada and run through hydropower production in the United States, that is shared 50-50 between the US and Canada. That's called the Canadian entitlement, and I'll explain that a little bit more lately, later. But at the time, Canada did not need that power. And so in the negotiation that took place between 1961 and 1964 between the province and uh, the federal government of Canada, uh, one of the things that the province asked for was upfront sale of some of that power. And so they entered into contracts for sale of that back to the United States for use in the Southwest for 30 years for around 250 million. And so Congress in the US authorized what's called the Northwest-Southwest intertie, which basically was the, the grid um, that connected the Pacific Northwest to the Southwest so that power sale could be viable. 
And then what was authorized under the treaty were the appointment of the operating entities. So the US side appointed two people, the head of Bonneville Power and the Northwest Division Engineer of the Army Corps. And Canada um, appointed a, an entity, um, BC Hydro. So when you hear reference to the entities, these are the entities, the operators, the implementers of that treaty. Well, why has that, that treaty for its production of hydropower and for its approach to sharing benefits across an international boundary has been held throughout the world as, as a model of transboundary treaties? But why is it under review and why do negotiations start tomorrow? Well, the one thing that changes, the main thing, is that assured flood control that I said was paid for by 60, with $65 million, that expires September 16th, 2024. And the other thing that, that is triggered by that date in the treaty is under international law, Canada and the US could have sat down at any point um, in the past 50 years and negotiated a change in the treaty. But what the treaty by its provisions allows is unilateral termination of the treaty. One country or the other can walk away. Earliest time they can do that is September 16th, 2024, and they have to give 10 years notice. So we're within that 10 year period before 2024 no notice has been given so far. Neither country has chosen to walk away from the treaty at this point. Well, that's all that happens. That's all that's changing. So the question is, why has the review been so broad? Why are there so many issues on the table? Well, that's because even though there are some things that never change, there are a number of things that have changed since 1964 that affect the treaty. First of all, energy demand. We thought in 1964, in both countries, we had this very rapid rise in energy demand following World War II. And we thought that straight line would continue, and therefore, hydropower would be our peaking power at this point, and we would be reliant on thermal power, primarily nuclear. And what that means, then, is if you're only using hydropower for peaking, it's far less valuable. Um, and so we thought that the Canadian entitlement, the benefits to the US of shared operation would not be so great. Instead, we all know what happened. We had the energy crisis of the 70s, the oil embargo. We learned that we could conserve our way out of new power plants. And the result is that even in the 20 year plan for the basin in, in the US, for electricity for the basin in the US, um, we anticipate hydropower to remain our base load. So our very valuable source of power and the, the um, renewables that are already licensed are enough to meet that demand 20 years in advance. So we did go in that direction. Climate change, another changer in the basin. And, and what you see on this, on, on your left, the, the light-colored map of the basin shows that predictions are that we won't have huge changes in water supply. But the big red map, the big ugly red map, that shows what happens to vegetative demand for water as temperatures rise. And so what that does is predicts water deficit within the basin simply because of temperatures rising. On the right side, you have already measured changes in the timing of runoff, and that's because particularly at the lower latitudes, our watersheds are changing from snow-dominated to rain-dominated. That's very important when timing of runoff is used to determine how you operate your dams for hydropower. Um, so this has this and what our energy future is because of technology change have huge areas of uncertainty. And that's one reason people are asking for science advisory panels in order to have a treaty that's more flexible and is informed going forward by science. I think the biggest story in the basin, though, is the capacity of the people in the basin, just shown by the number of people in this room and a number of people who have signed up for this and those listening on webcasts. Um, since 1964, there have been a number of 
organizations and cha legal changes within the basin that have given people within the basin more power. So in the US, the Northwest Power and Conservation Council does the energy planning and fish and wildlife program. It's composed of a compact between the four main states, Montana, Idaho, Oregon, and Washington. Similar to that, within the basin, the Columbia, you have the Columbia Basin Trust authorized to receive hydropower revenues in 1995, and they do a considerable amount of education within the basin and economic development planning, as well as planning on climate change. You have the Bolt decision in the US in the 1970s, which recognized the treaty fishing rights of the tribe, and that has really given rise to the tribes as co-managers of fisheries in the basin, and highly sophisticated science and policy agencies helping them um, give a voice to tribal management of fisheries. The Constitution Act in Canada, 1982, requires consultation with First Nations. So rising empowerment of tribes and First Nations on both sides of the border. And that really became evident during the review process in the participation of the 15 tribes on the US side of the border. In 2010, they came forward with a document called the Common Views on the Future of the Columbia River Treaty. And through the review process in the US in which the 15 tribes were represented by five people on a sovereign review team and the four states were represented by one person each on the sovereign review team, the tribes brought to the table the desire to elevate ecosystem function to a third prong of the treaty. And that came through in the regional review. So that just shows you the paradigm shift in empowerment of voices within the basin that have brought other issues to the table. Also, the legal landscape has changed for Canadian First Nations, and you have going from, from rulings that say that Aboriginal title did survive settlement and colonization to more recent rulings um, in the Chilcotin ruling that says that even when that interest is only a claim, consultation has to occur. And there needs to be a sliding scale depending on the, the claim to an actual realized um, recognition of native title on the land. The other thing that's changed in the basin is we realized as the dams were being built between in, in the US between the 30s and the 70s and, and the treaty dams in Canada all the way up through the 70s, um, that these would affect the, the ecological system within the basin. What has changed is that we care. So the, the map of the basin shows in, in kind of um, ironically salmon color, the part of the basin that is now blocked from salmon migration uh, by dams. And that's about 37% of the former spawning habitat within the basin. The lighter pink were, were blocked by natural features. Um, you see up in, the, up in the upper right the listings of species in the US within the basin. In Canada, in the main stem, of course, Grand Coulee in the, and Chief Joseph in the US block anadromous fish from getting into the main stem, but you do have anadromous fish going up the Okanagan in Canada. And so that passage of the Endangered Species Act, the Species of Risk, at Risk Act in Canada, illustrates the, the rising value that people have put on the ecosystem. And finally, the lower graph ch shows the change in the hydrograph. That was done on purpose in order to be able to produce hydropower and even out the, the spring freshet. But that also slows the migration of smolts from the headwaters out to sea. And that has changed the survival rates of salmon. OK, so, so given all those changes and all those issues that people bring to the table, um, the US and British Columbia underwent regional reviews from 2010 to 2013. And you just see on this slide a synopsis of what both sides came out with. Both sides identifying similar issues, 
but having subtle differences. And what I wanted to do in the last few minutes is just explain the subtle differences between the two sides on each of the issues listed here. First of all, we have um, the Canadian entitlement. And, and I love this slide because it helps explain it. So you can, of course, tell the little maple leaves are Canadian dams. And every time water is released from one of those dams, it can produce hydropower at every single dam below it. 50% of that added increment of produced hydropower is the Canadian entitlement. The treaty has that delivered to British Columbia, but actually what happens is the, is the bulk of it is sold on the market. The original, originally it was sold in those 30-year contracts, now it's sold on the market. It's been as high as 350 million in one year for sale and much lower now with um, so much natural gas coming onto the market, um, which I hear you have all kinds of issues about these days. Um, so what the US wants, of course, is to pay less Canadian entitlement, and Canada wants to pay more. Um, what the US says is that we've already paid for the dams. Why do we do this? Well, what the US needs to be reminded is that the fundamental basis of the treaty was not the US paying for the dams. It was shared benefits. The Canadian entitlement reflects shared benefits, release of water upstream, production of power downstream. Canada says we want more. You use that water both for production of hydropower and for ecosystem function. And yet what, what the US would say is you have harm in Canada from building the dams. Um, we have harm in the US from building the dams. So in both cases, we're talking about mitigation from the, the use of the dams, not benefits. And so, one, one way to look at this as a matter of diplomacy, you often, if you elevate the dialogue to a higher level, you can kind of start to see um, ways to resolve differences. And if the US and Canada can think about the, these negotiations as not only having the fundamental pr principle of shared benefits, but the fundamental principle of mitigation of harm in both countries, they might be able to reach agreement. Um, flood control. So remember I said that the flood of 1948 was a, around a million cubic feet per second at the Dalles. Well, the treaty has assured flood control trying to target a low level of 450,000 CFS as the peak flow at the Dalles. And then fallback provisions once that expires of U.S. being able to call upon Canada when the flows are going to reach 600,000 cubic feet per second. Well, it turns out from all the research we've done that those numbers were kind of best guesses. And today, with a period of record, we do not have to any longer rely on best guesses. We have data. Um, and while there may have been studies done, there are not studies that have been released to the public that show what the real level we need is. But I had a student do archival research, and in the 86 times, um, by the time he did re the research, that the flow has exceeded 450,000 CFS, being as high in one year as 550,000 CFS, this year 500,000 CFS, we had very minor flooding that could have been handled by either moving parks out of the, the flood range or by putting in small structural features. So it's quite possible that the difference between the US and Canada can be bridged by science and that the real level is closer to 550,000 CFS in terms of needs for assured flood control. Ecosystem function, the, the US review asked that ecosystem function be elevated to a third prong of the treaty. And one of the things about that that makes people nervous is ecosystem function exists at many scales. So there are international issues having to do with flow, water quality, meaning temperature, and fish passage across an international boundary. But then there are all the habitat issues that go along with ecosystem function that people do not want to elevate to an international level. 
Some of the studies that we've done on governance suggest that what you could do is you could mimic other international agreements where you just address those issues that are international and then allow for subnational coordination of issues like habitat restoration. That's another activity that could be easily informed by a scientific body. Well, finally, we are commencing negotiations now. And one of the interesting things when you think of both recommendations saying there should be greater transparency going forward and all of the forums that have been held throughout the basin to do that, neither side has allowed First Nations or tribes or observers at the table. And even in the 1950s and 60s, when there was much less of an expectation of public participation. On the US side, there were congressional observers or their staff in the room for negotiations. So this is a serious difference that people in the basin are starting to organize over. And as negotiations commence tomorrow, I'm sure we will be hearing more about that issue. And, and so finally, I'll conclude with one of the things that kind of governs um, the negotiations going forward. We have aging infrastructure in this basin, and we have an opportunity to negotiate to modernize the treaty. This is a chance for reconciliation of ecosystem function with the benefits we have from the basin, from hydropower, and from the development, from flood control and reconciliation of First Nations and tribal governments with the rest of the people within the basin. So thank you. Thank you very, thank you very much, Barb. Um, in the interest of time, I'm gonna ask people to, if they've got some questions, to limit them to points of clarification or something they want an urgent answer to, but uh, keep your question very pointed. And then I'll proceed with the next uh, presentation. Have I scared you all off? to respond? No. Okay, well, I'm going to, um, I'm standing in for Rich Boy, who is um, an American representative on the IJC. Rich is, and I worked together on the Flathead reference to the IGC. The Flathead is a river in eastern Kootenays that um, crosses the border into Montana. And in the mid-80s, there was a proposal for a major coal development on, on a tributary to the Flathead called Sage Creek. And the IGC was asked to review uh, the environmental implications of that. And the commission reported back in, in the late 80s uh, with a proposal not to proceed with the mine because the environmental effects into the states were uh, too, too significant. So he and I worked together on that. And as I mentioned in my introductions, we were asked jointly to uh, draft a chapter for the book on the history of the IGC. Uh, in Canada, and we put together the chapter for British Columbia. So I'm going to be uh, walking through this fairly briefly because some of the um, slides I'm not that familiar with, but I will talk to the ones that I am familiar with. So we're talking uh, quickly about the history of the IGC relative to the Columbia Basin Treaty, its key functions, uh, which are three, and we'll come to, and the uh, some of the new developments of the uh, IJC as a manager of international waterways, which uh, both Rich and I feel have relevance to support the treaty renegotiation process in the next uh, year. I'm going to skip this one. Um, and I'm going to show you two slides, which apparently are not photoshopped. So this picture shows um, the Niagara Falls. Uh, I can't remember which year. 
But when they were doing some maintenance on the falls and they shut the water off completely. So it's actually an, a, a historical occurrence. And this one shows the falls today. And I think what all Rich was pointing out is that the role of the IJC is to make sure that we don't have the picture on the top left and we always have the picture on the top or bottom right of collaborative management. So there are, uh, the, the whole point of the IGC, which was created by the uh, International Treaty in um, 1909, is it has two major functions. One is um, uh, equal opportunity to manage water that crosses the border so that there are equal opportunities for both Americans and Canadians. Uh, defined in the way they manage the water. So they protect the interests of both nations on an equal basis. And that's Article 8 of the treaty. And Article 4 is the one that triggered the uh, Flathead reference where the waters um, shall not be polluted on either side of the border. Okay. So um, that was the reference. And I should point out that the IGC uh, operates with a reference from the both Canadian and American departments of state. So they, they're not an independent agency, they have to be asked to do their work. So there are three types of uh, roles that the IGC plays. One is um, an application submitted through the two governments to undertake an analysis of boundary treaty water issues. And the biggest one and the longest running one is the Great Lakes uh, initiative to protect water quality and flows into the Great Lakes on both sides of the border. The second one is where there are specific references where the governments asked them to deal with a particular issue, and that was the case of the flathead. And uh, the third one is where they look at emerging issues uh, on behalf of both governments and uh, bring science to, bring, to bear on how these issues can be managed in the future. So the principles are that there's uh, e equality between the two countries. It's a science-based organization, evidence-based. Uh, people who serve on the commission don't serve specifically as their own scientists. They serve more generally in terms of their understanding of science. Decisions are made by consensus. Uh, and um, there's a lot of stakeholder involvement and uh, engagement with First Nations. So it's a very collaborative model of operation. And in every case, in the last 100 or so years, pretty well agreement has been reached in every reference that the uh, IGC has taken. And there's a sliver of blue here. I have no idea which of the ones that didn't uh, succeed, but not in the recent uh, past. I'm going to pass over that. So the commissioners were all appointed under a previous government. So the US commissioners were pre uh, com um, appointed under President Obama, and the three Canadian commissioners were appointed under uh, Prime Minister Harper. So they haven't been changed as a result of the changes in government by both parties in the last three or four years. Um, so Rich Moy has been on the commission for seven years, um, starting in 2011. And here is a map uh, showing the uh, major uh, international basins that the IGC has had one or other of its involvements, either a reference or an application to apply its science. Um, so they pretty well crossed the entire border from east to west. And you'll see the Columbia Basin um, in the second last of the basins in BC. So the role of the uh, um, IGC in, in the developing the um, I'm going to skip this because I've covered this largely, is the, um, the, the IGC was asked in the after the floods that uh, Bob talked about, it started the negotiations for the original treaty in, 19, in the 1950s, uh, that the IGC was asked in 1944 to do un undertake the technical studies that provided the uh, science and techni technical analysis behind the uh, sequence of dams that were produced by the, uh, in the treaty, the three dams in Canada, including the Libby Dam. So all of the technical analysis was done by AGC through a joint engineering board. Um, um, and they did a, a tremendous amount of work. And I think it's fair to say that the treaty could not have been developed without the role of the IGC over that 10 year period. And um, 
there, there was actually consensus as a result of all of that work. And so there was a fairly straightforward negotiation once the reports were completed by Canada and the US to come to a conclusion on the uh, Columbia Treaty. In fact, the treaty was signed in principle in 1961, two years after the submission of the final technical reports by the IGC. And it was ratified in 1964. So that's actually given today's world a fairly uh, quick uh, ratification. So um, I think we've covered a lot of this one. I'm going to kind of come to the um, areas of innovation that um, Rich wanted me to talk to because the IJC continues to evolve, evolve as a um, science-based uh, body to provide advice to the governments on all international water issues. And an example in Great Lakes in, 19, in 2012, the water quality agreement was uh, radically changed in terms of its governance to broaden the uh, a range of uh, analysis undertaken from primary nutrient pollution and water quality to include groundwater, habitat change, and uh, climate uh, change too. So the remit of the IGC has evolved as a result of the historical development of issues in the Great Lakes. And then more importantly, the governance structure has broadened to include both um, science, so there's two scientific panels, one of scientists who are uh, independent, either consultants or academics from universities, and another one which is um, a group of scientists from government agencies, both state and local governments, both in the American and Canadian systems. So in the Great Lakes, there's a very broad-based, independent and agency-based science body that advises the commissioners on the management of the Great Lakes Basin. The other thing is that the commission is broadening its approach to other basins uh, across Canada, um, looking at ecosystem management as a component of water management, so it's taking a more holistic view than was the case in the um, earlier years of its mandate. It's spending a lot of time on harmonizing data and the quality of data between uh, within each of the jurisdictions, Americans and the Canadians, and between the jurisdictions, so that the water quality, or the water data, are more uh, robust and useful to both countries. Uh, they've also brought in some strong liaison with local governments, um, particularly in Lake of the Woods and the Rainy River, so that there's much more bottom-up um, advice than top-down advice than was the case in the past. And uh, this, they've developed a broader shared vision of uh, evolving issues in these basins. So Richie's idea is the role of the um, IJC, or an equivalent of the IJC, should be, sub, should be provided to supplement the work of the negotiating teams. So he feels strongly that the um, IJC has ability to attract science from all ranges of life to deal with the issues outlined by Barb in the renegotiated treaty and set up a binational science panel that can provide independent advice to the negotiators. And these would include um, a holistic approach to the basin. So. Uh, the current uh, model is the Columbia River Treaty because it actually deals only with the Columbia River. It doesn't deal with the Columbia Basin, which is a much bigger entity and includes the Okanagan Similkameen, for example. So um, one of the th roles that the IGC could play would be to broaden some of the issues that are in the basin rather than limited to the river itself. They would certainly have the capacity to advise on salmon management and the restoration of salmon in the system. Uh, they have a good track record of engaging with scientists at the um, First Nations and in local communities. Um, so they could build a more robust science model to advise the uh, negotiators. They now have a good understanding of changing climate changing hydrology and how that affects future flows and developing scenarios of hydrology that have to be addressed as the climate changes. 
Um, and they have the capacity, if, if people want it, to develop a, and bring together a group of prominent scientists from both sides of the border to look on uh, you know, a common basis at the way um, the Columbia might be managed in the future and bring uh, independent science to the advice and knowledge of the communicators. So I want to leave that there because it's a theme that I'll be uh, returning to on my own presentation in the next uh, panel. Uh, and it's also a theme that as um, from my own past history, I think has a lot of resonance in uh, helping to complete a modernized treaty. So thanks very much for your attention. I'm not sure if I can answer any questions. I'm not Rich Moy, but uh, if anyone has anything I can pass on. Okay, well then I will ask uh, Chief Wayne Christian to come to the tape. So uh, Wayne is the chief of the Schwamp First Nation. Swamp First Nation, which uh, covers the Upper Columbia and parts of the Shuswap. So it's one of the three uh, tribal groupings in the Columbia. Um, and he has the uh, vast experience in working with the government and with the um, local um, provincial uh, Columbia Advisory Committee in giving advice to the BC government on the way the treaty should be developed. So it's a great pleasure that you get the, his first experience on the role of the treaty going forward. Waiko uh, Haitap. Hello, everyone. Uh, Kalmuk's Quest uh, 115. My Indian name is uh, Big Voice Who Speaks the Truth. It comes from my great great grandfather. Uh, and Jao Kukpi uh, Spalatina, I'm the chief of the people of Splatsin, of the Sokhapam Nation. I'm also uh, one of the tribal chiefs of the Sokhapam Nation. I uh, first want to acknowledge the ancestors of the territory and the present day descendants and the elder this morning, Mary Sam, that gave a, a real example of our, what I call our traditional ecological experts that know the history and know the land and know everything about it in a song. That song was a powerful song. If you were listening to it, you could kind of just feel going back, you know, years and years. It just was a powerful process. So I want to acknowledge the people here because they've been here for 10,000 years and more, just like our people have been where we have been. Uh, my original presentation I was doing, I was asked, and I really want to thank the organizers for inviting me here, was actually on Sokopam Law. I was doing a real nice PowerPoint and getting all that ready with pictures so you didn't have to listen to me talk, you could look at the screen. <laughs> uh, but then on uh, uh, May 17th, an announcement happened. As you know that uh, Canada uh, told our uh, people, our negotiators at the table that we're, we were not gonna be at the negotiating table with the US, nor would we even be in the room. And this unilateral decision how can I explain this as a fundamental betrayal? We see it in terms of good faith that we've been working with Canada and British Columbia on the Columbia River Treaty since 2011. And it really has demonstrated to us that uh, this decision to exclude the Sokhapam, the Tanaka and the Silx, the Okanagan is contrary to international law and the recognition of Canadian law that the uh, title and rights holders have a right to consent to any activities on our land, and including the Columbia River uh, system. So it's important, uh, what I'm gonna talk about today is uh, just sort of uh, some of those issues, because it's, uh, I, I can't explain the betrayal you feel that uh, you have a prime minister that's been advocating internationally and speaking at the United Nations about nation to nation, you know, the right recognition, blah, 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 partnership, you know, and, and uh, it was an opportune time for him to uh, actually do something. And the minister, uh, and the surprising thing for us was we got it in a text message to the negotiator for Canada and he read it out. Uh, it's that kind of sort of uh, process, you know, it's kind of really demeaning and then really uh, insulting to us as, uh, you know, the title and rights holders of that part of the world and as nations of people. 
We're not Indian bands, we're nations of people because we've not ceded, sold, nor surrendered our lands or water. So I think it's important in that context uh, what I'm speaking about today in terms of what we need to do. And I see there's some uh, silks people here. Uh, you know, the Okanagan are represented here today and really important. Uh, I don't know if there's any Tanaka here as well, but uh, we're coming together to decide what to do later this week because they're, as you know, starting the negotiations tomorrow. So in 1964, when the Columbia River Treaty came into effect, I was 10 years old. Uh, and I can remember as a child at, uh, walking around a little town I grew up in, I grew up around Enderby, and seeing signs in restaurants that said, no dogs or no Indians. And I didn't understand what that meant in terms of the racism and how we were excluded from things like eating, right? Um, so today, uh, the signs in Washington in DC and Ottawa just says no Indians. <laughs> Specifically, no Sokopam, no Tanaka, no Silks. We're not allowed in the room. And so it's important to understand that concept. It's really at, at the foundation of this, we still see this, the uh, doctrine of discovery at work and the whole process of how Canada sees itself as our how do you put it, big brother and looking after us. We're not wards of the state. We're, we're a nation of people. And it's really important Canada, specifically Prime Minister Trudeau, uh, Minister Freeland, and also Minister J, you know, Jody Wilson-Rabel should know this, that we are indigenous and we're sovereign in our lands. We've not ceded, sold, nor surrendered those lands or, or waters. And it's important, I'll keep saying that over and over because it's critical to where we're going. The Silk Routine decision, which was mentioned in earlier presentations in 2014, uh, really talked a lot about uh, you know, the actual title and how that was done. One of the important pieces in that Supreme Court decision was it struck down the doctrine of terra nullis, which is the doctrine of the land is empty. It struck down in that Supreme Court decision. If you read through it, you can see it says right there in law. And uh, I think that's an important understanding because uh, and the other important part of that uh, Supreme Court decision was it talked about consent. I think it's mentioned probably 60 to 70 times in the actual decision, consent, 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 consent. And it's really, really important. It appears though that uh, the Prime Minister didn't get the memo on uh, the doctrine of terra nullis, the land is empty. You know, it appears that uh, he seems to ignore his own law. And that's the problem with lawmakers is they ignore their own law. In uh, 1910, our ancestors said it in this way. What happens is you get one law for the rich white people, one law for the poor white, yet another law for the Indian, and how it's enforced on us. And that's what we see in the dynamics that's going on in Canada because of the doctrine of discovery. So I think you need to have that context in, in terms of how we uh, sort of move forward on this. Our Sokwapam laws and the laws of the, the interior tribes, these go back thousands of years through our oral history. In our oral history, it ties us to the rivers and to the system, specifically the Columbia River system. It was recorded in the 1900s by uh, James Tate who talked about how the coyote freed that salmon at the uh, at Portland and brought the salmon up the Columbia River and understanding that, that the salmon has a real important part of our culture. And so it ties us all along the river uh, in terms of that creation story and how salmon came to be for our people. The Columbia River system was really important. And so I think in, in understanding that, uh, you have to understand that uh, the actual Western science has proven this and proven it with our oral history. They go alongside it, that geology and corroborated with geology and biology, that the things we talk about in our oral history can actually be corroborated with your science. And it's been coming more and more known in terms of, uh, you know, we just released a book that talked about so often laws, land, and people. And I think other, the, so I talk about our traditional ecological experts or knowledge experts have that knowledge and it's been passed down for thousands of years. And that's what our law is, is passed down in that way and it's really important. Because we're doing work here at the University of Victoria with the law uh, program around our indigenous laws. We've been working on this for a while now. 
And I think it's important to understand the concepts. It's not foreign. We have laws. We are a people that had laws. We had customs. We had a language. We had lands, et cetera, et cetera. We weren't nomadic and wandering around. We actually were a, a society that was really quite organized. And I think it's important. So I think that in itself, when you talk about the, the whole concept of the Columbia Basin, you have to understand that uh, the, there was two stories. There's one, the story about the uh, salmon coming up the Columbia River, but also there's the one on the Thompson River, and where the Thompson River actually once flowed all through, and I think you know your, those of you that are, know this stuff, flowed all, it just flowed all through the Columbia River at one time until the ice dam about 10,000 years ago. And that's the story about coyote bringing up the salmon from that part. And still today, the genetics of the uh, coho salmon specifically are genetically tied to the Columbia River that come up the Thompson, the North and South Thompson River. And also the kakasu, the spring salmon that we fish in our area, are genetically linked to the Columbia River. So you can see that when we say these things, it's not like it's a, it's a myth and uh, it's something that's out of thin air. It's something that we can corroborate with our own, and your science corroborates it with your science. And so our laws are really important to show that we've been here for a while. And I think it's really, really critical to the whole process because I think that uh, we have to understand that uh, the foundation of who we are and our interaction with this uh, specific agreement is really based on our laws and the fact we've not sold ceded nor surrendered our lands, resources, or our people. And you've got to keep understanding that. That's really, really important in terms of this whole process. So it's been talked a little bit about uh, the issue of uh, the current shifting dynamics that was mentioned in the first presentation around the law. Uh, you know, the issue of the ownership of our lands, which the courts are calling Aboriginal title. And it's interesting concepts because uh, in Canadian law, it's been confirmed that it gives us the right to use, control the land, and enjoy its benefits. Not only right now, but into the future. Really, in the, in the Silk Routine decision, it talked about making sure we made decisions in the use of that land for future generations, because that's a principle we have. And in the Silk Routine decision, it talks about that. And so it's really important. And it also says we don't have to prove our title and rights in court Again, those rights are recognized and affirmed in Canada's constitution. And I think that's really important and we need to protect and enforce our rights. And this is the interesting part that you've heard Canada and you've heard British Columbia talk about uh, the endorsement and implementing UNDRIP, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. And the heart of that whole recognition is the right of self-determination. We have a people in Article 3 and 4 talks about the right of self-determination. And I think at the heart of all this process is it's an opportune time, and that's why we're a bit stunned that Canada wouldn't step up and say, yeah, come into the room with us as we recognize you as who you are, as you originally had organized yourself as nations. And that's what's so stunning about this to us is that uh, it's really kind of interesting. And it really includes in uh, the court decisions and the uh, UNDRIP about free prior informed consent and the right to be involved in all decision-making uh, involving our people and our land, because it's still our lands. It's still our river. It's not gone away. Nobody's, you know, even though it's assumed jurisdiction over the past 150 years, remember, we've been here for 10,000 years. We're not going away. And it's really important that Canada come to grips with that, and that uh, I think British Columbia as well, they're starting to. We see more and more of it happening, and uh, I'm, uh, I'm interested to see what the minister has to say about all of this, because uh, it's interesting in terms of where things are going in terms of Indigenous people. <coughs> Canada will ultimately have to uh, seek free prior and informed consent of the uh, Indigenous nations in the interior. And what does that mean? And I think really what it is, is they really, in order for it to be free, it's not free. <laughs> and what I mean by that is they have to provide adequate resources so we can actually do our own evaluation. You know, and that's the big problem is that they, they keep treating us as uh, sort of uh, off the side of the desk. They don't treat us and give us the resources so we can respond properly. And they wonder why we don't engage and we don't actually make good decisions because we're not given the resources to actually make those good decisions. So, 
in fact, and with our own time frames and without external pressure to conclude a deal. Because that's always a thing. We give you money, we want you to do something for us. And it can't be that, it can't be that way. If they truly want consent, then they have to provide adequate resources and, uh, in terms of free consent, and that's what that is. And it's gotta be enough time and notice to our people uh, to understand the issues. Because for us, we've got 10,000, 15,000 of helping people. And the way we're structured is there's no central governing authority. It's really governed by regions, it's governed by families. And so we have to find a way that this process goes into our governance system and gets consent. It's not done by band councils. Band councils are an extension of Indian Affairs, an extension of the federal government. So there has to be a different process. And so we have to have time because this is what Canada and British Columbia destroyed. They attacked our governance system, our families. We governed our people, our lands and water and everything through our families. That's how we govern the territory. They attacked that. They attacked our children. They went to war against our children, our families. They destroyed that governance system on the land. They took us off that and put us on reserves. You have to have permission to leave the reserve. Anyways, I, was, I get pretty angry about that. I'm still angry about it because I see the devastating impact of this. So they have to really understand that they need to resource us to get our families rebuilt and reorganized and govern our territory again. That's what this is about for us. It's about helping Canada and British Columbia rebuilding, helping rebuild what they destroyed by their law. Legislative genocide is what I call it. They use their laws to kill us. And you think about today with all the children in care, uh, more than in the state, than there ever was in residential schools. Thousands of children, thousands of children under the laws of the provinces with consent of the federal government. And we're not involved. Think about that for a minute. This is 2018. This is not 1900s or 1867. This is 2018. Things have to change. So really, consent really will be about that and getting relevant issues on the table for us. We've heard some of it, ecosystem function, the return of the salmon, and we can get into that debate. I think it's really important. But we have four sort of strategies or four key priorities that we see as important. The first one is the one river approach. In all the dialogue I've heard about the Columbia River Treaty, people seem to forget the Columbia River, first and foremost, is a river. It's water. They forget that all the things you're talking about in terms of the science and everything really boils down to water. Either there's more water or less water. And then the whole issue of flood control and how that water has created an economic uh, in, the lower, in the lower 40 across the border and economic prosperity for the United States. And I think you have to understand water is critical to our survival as a people. You know, we're taught very clearly that, uh, that life begins with that single drop of rain when it hits the top of those mountains. And it goes down and feeds the whole mountain all the way down, right down into the creeks and lakes and rivers and into the ocean and it cycles back. It's just what it does. It's this natural cycle. Our people, we were taught that, how important water is. And so the Columbia River is really important that uh, we have to really consider the, the cumulative effects of what's going on. You know, uh, since this has been set up, the ecology, the, uh, uh, the ecosystem function of the river in terms of what that means. It's not just about uh, flood control. It's not just about hydro generation. It's about the animals. It's about the fish. It's about the people. It's about the medicines. It's about everything along that river that sustains life through that water. It's critical to the function of us as a people in this part of the world. It's really, really important. And in the One River approach, restoration of natural flow is really important. You know, restoration of the salmon to the upper Columbia River. You know, the uh, people in the Shushop Indian Band, uh, when they uh, shut down originally, the first dam that went up was the uh, Grand Coulee, and the federal government showed up uh, with uh, cases of spam to give to the people there and to say that this is what you're going to get because you've lost your salmon as spam. Uh, think about that, you know. They're trading something that's culturally, spiritually, 
and it has a real significance in our culture and our language and who we are, and, and give us a can of spam. How is that relevant? How are you going to teach a child to catch that can of salmon or a can of spam? How are you going to teach them to spear it, to net it, the songs that go with that? You know what I mean? Think about it. Really, really important. Because salmon is so important to our people. It's our survival. It, uh, what took us in the, our creation stories off the desolate land, and the Creator brought them to us and fed us and, and sustained life in us and gave us life. Anyways, it's just, I get really passionate about this stuff. The other thing is that uh, we, a priority is that uh, we in the interior are really coming together as one voice. You know, we have a lot of differences in terms of our interpretation of things, but I think with the recent announcement, uh, it's really going to push us to uh, seek ways to come together that we've never, ever done before. And uh, Canada, and I thank Canada for that in some ways, is really disheartened what they've done, but I think they've uh, given us an opportunity to do something collectively. And you'll see that in the coming uh, weeks and months in terms of what we're going to do, because we'll be speaking with one voice, and it's really important. The other priority we had was a seat at the table. And that, uh, you know, I know Canada, and I was talking with Ken earlier this morning, is that they're going to be talking with us, and yeah, have that consultation with us, and, but we won't be at the actual table, that'll just be with Canada. We have a hard time sending somebody into a negotiating process that we don't trust. And that's what's happened with this latest decision. We really don't trust Canada. Everything we've ever seen from Canada has led to us as a people being excluded, either by law or by process. And so I think it's really, really important. The whole issue of, uh, it's no longer about consultation. It's about consent. Consultation as a process is dead. We have to look at consent is the way forward with this whole process is really, really important. The other aspects that we look at as a priority is economic compensation. In 1910, our chiefs in the memorials of Swarford Laurier were very clear that we would share everything and with the newcomers in our land, the settlers come into our territory, we would share everything equally. I'm going to paraphrase here. We will share everything equally and treat you as brothers. What is yours is mine, and what is mine is yours. We will share everything 50-50, and that's what it says in 1910, the concept of reciprocal accountability. And so it's really important in terms of the uh, issue of the Columbia River is that we have not seen uh, any benefits uh, from this process, any economic benefits. The downstream uh, benefits are there. The territory has been uh, so severely impacted, uh, we've never ever been received compensation for the initial sort of damage that was done and what happened with our burial sites, our village sites, the migration of moose, caribou, all of those things our people relied on, all those things were disrupted and there was nothing ever done to, to deal with those uh, past processes. You know, in uh, uh, British Columbia alone has received hundreds of millions in cash since the treaty came into effect in 1964. You know, where is the indigenous portion? Uh, where, where can we actually point to that this is actually there? And we say if, uh, if 1,100 square kilometers of our tidal lands have been flooded, would we, would we receive 1,100 square kilometers of different land in return? You know, these are the things we're talking about. The Columbia Basin Trust that was set up by the provincial government, and I believe it's Premier Horgan actually who was working on this uh, once upon a time, that uh, it had very little input from us in terms of setting it up. And I think the Tanaka have a representative on the board, but the other two nations were not engaged in that process. And we've not received uh, benefits the way the non-Indigenous local governments have. They've received millions of dollars to create infrastructure in our communities, cultural, uh, recreation, et cetera, et cetera. Our communities have not seen that same kind of benefit. So I think it's really important that uh, the Columbia Basin Trust has really uh, invested a lot in the region, but not in our communities. 
And I think that's when we talk about economic benefit that we really need to sort of get involved in that. Down in the U.S., the shipping industry in the U.S. transport more than 12 billion annually in the lower portion of the Columbia. Uh, 12 billion annually. And agriculture in the U.S. has benefited uh, by $5 billion where our lands were flooded. So I really think that the economic considerations is important. And I guess I'm, in closing, uh, those of you that believe that we should be there at the table and part of the nation-to-nation -nation process that's been uh, widely advertised right across Canada. I urge you to write Prime Minister Trudeau, uh, Minister Freeland, Minister jo uh, Jody Wilson-Raybo, and tell her uh, to get us involved, get us at that table, and to recognize their commitments they've made publicly and they're going to make in law with Bill 262 that's going into legislation, the implementation of federal law for the recognition of UNDRIP. So again, I thank for the opportunity to be here with you today and to give you our perspective. It uh, would have been a different presentation if the announcement on the 17th didn't happen. I would have given you more in depth around the actual, our law on the land and water and what it means. So again, I thank you for your time. I'm very glad you came, Chief. Uh, it was a wonderful exposition of what has happened in the past and so important for us all to hear. And we will be following up on your comments later in the day. So it's now my uh, pleasure to introduce Minister Christine Conroy. Um, probably most of you know that... Yes, sir, do you have a quick question? Yeah, quick question. Um, Chief, um, I'd, re I'd recommend that you contact your lawyers. Okay. That's what I mean. Just that we're talking about the law. You have a right to be there. You're talking about it. Talk to your talk to your lawyer and have him get his application in there and talk to the to the minister. I'll also do what I can do on my side. Thank you, Thank you for that comment. Thank you. Uh, it's a, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Minister Conroy. Now, Minister Conroy is uh, Minister for Children and Family Development, and as a uh, ex-deputy in the provincial government. I know that's a huge job in its own right. But she also is taken on the responsibility for shepherding the Columbia Treaty through on behalf of the provincial government because she is the MLA for the West Kootenay, so Columbia is her back door. And my experience in working with her and her husband has been that they're passionate about the issues associated with the Columbia. And I'm personally very pleased that she's uh, retained this portfolio and we'll be working with uh, the folks in the provincial government and some of the folks in this room in bringing this treaty to a success successful conclusion. So thank you very much for taking the time to come here. Looking forward to your presentation. Thank you, John. I had to get leave to be here this morning because the house is sitting, so I'm really happy to be here too. <laughs> and um, I'm honored to be on the traditional territory of the Saanich and uh, Laguangan speaking people. And uh, I also want to thank the organizers, because I know how much work it took to get this uh, together. And, and uh, I want to thank you for pulling everybody together, because I know how important this uh, discussion is. And it was only <clears throat> actually last week, the beginning of the week, that we learned that the uh, uh, discussions, that they were going to launch the negotiations down in, in D.C. starting tomorrow. So today's symposium is very timely. Um, in fact, our uh, lead negotiator from B.C., <clears throat> excuse me, Kathy Eichenberger, who was supposed to speak this afternoon and can't be here because she is on her way to D.C. as, as we speak. So, um, And I want to talk a bit about why the negotiations are so significant to me. Um, and as John has said, um, I'm from the, the Basin, um, and it, it was a great honor for me to serve as critic uh, when I was in opposition. I've been elected since 2005, and the entire time I was uh, the critic for uh, the opposition. And when I became minister uh, responsible, it was, um, people question that. I am the minister responsible for children and family development and, and also all things Columbia because it's Columbia River Treaty, Columbia Basin Trust, and the Columbia Power Corporation. And some people wondered how many social workers it was going to take to negotiate the <laughs> treaty. But uh, we, we confirmed and assured them that uh, the uh, Ministry of uh, um, Energy Mines and Petroleum Resources has 
Um, I've seconded their staff that have been involved with the treaty negotiations and the work that's been done since day one. So they work with me. So we don't have to worry about any social workers doing that. So, And a lot of the stuff has already, the benefit of going last, a number of things I was going to talk about has already been mentioned, but I will repeat some of it because I understand when you hear things twice, you, you actually retain it. That's what they tell me. So, And I'm learning that in this job. Um, so the, the treaty is one of the best examples of international uh, water agreements in the world, as John has said, but it's also been just more than a half a century since it was ratified. And today there are a lot of other things on the table, as you've heard, things that just weren't considered important in the late 50s, early 60s when the discussions were started. And so we need to, as we gear up to the treaty, ask ourselves the questions, what should we do differently this time? How can we make sure the voices of the Columbia Basin are heard? And what wasn't considered in the 60s that definitely needs to be considered today? And I know you'll be hearing from some other people this afternoon who will answer probably those questions. I'm looking at you, Greg, in a lot more detail than I will. So it's great that uh, there's experts here in the room as well. And as uh, Barb said, the original treaty was just about uh, power control or power generation and, and flood control. And, and there, was, there was no recognition for what was... Um, what was left behind, what wasn't discussed in those days. Um, currently, the treaty returns approximately $120 million a year on, on the um, uh, Canadian entitlement. Um, some years, it's been around $300 million, but uh, the average right now is about $120 million. Um, it's also meant that there has been significant uh, issues to... It's prevented flood control. It's prevented floods. Um, the years 2012 and 2013 in our region, there was there was significant flooding, and and it was controlled. Um, we uh, never will again see the the issues of what we saw in Banport uh, back in the late 40s when uh, the entire community was wiped out and uh, thousands of like, people died. Um, in fact, in the in our region in the uh, late 40s, um, my husband's here with me today, and I'm going to tell him how old you were. Um, he was two in 1948. And uh, his family farm is where the Hugh Kingley side dam sits now, and there's no baby pictures of him before he turned two because they were all lost in the flood. So there was a lot lost in the, in the region. And um, the communities like Kimberley, we were just at an event on uh, Saturday night, and, and some people were there, and they were telling us how the, uh, she was a little girl. She said she was six years old at the time, and her dad was a reporter. And they were out in Kimberley dealing with the floods, and, and her dad said, go behind this building here. She went behind the building, and, and what they were doing, they were blowing, they had miners from Kimberley, blowing up houses that were getting carried away by the, the floods with dynamite, because that was the only way they could get rid of them and, and prevent any further flooding. And she said as a six-year-old, she thought, wow, that was cool. And now she thinks about it, she thought, oh my God, what would people think about that? So just the, the stories, though, are, they, they go on and on, and... And in those days, there was no consideration for the people, as, as uh, Chief Christian has said. There was no consideration of First Nations. There was no consideration of people of the basin. Um, the story that sticks with me is a family from Burton who was told, um, you need to pack your stuff and get it out of your house because we're burning your house down tomorrow. They couldn't get it all out, so they put the rest of their stuff in the shed. They came back the next day, and the, both the house and the shed were born, burned to the ground with the rest of their belongings. And that happened to many people. And, and the people of the day, the BC Hydro, they were doing their job. And nowadays you talk to the people that did that and they thought, my God, we, you know, we were just doing our job because that was what they did. And it was, you know, so those kind of stories stick throughout the basin for, and they will stick and they continue to stick to this day. Um, you know, we only, I think that uh, when we talk about the flood control, we need to think that this year could be, I mean, we keep hearing about the uh, significant snowpack we have and, um, at this time, there's there's no worries, so to speak, so far, although we, we do have some flooding in neighboring communities. As um, Right now, there's some concerns about the Slocan River, which is a tributary of the, of the Kootenai, which flows into the Columbia. So there is some worries, but because of where we are and, and uh, the fact that we have the flood control in our region, we will not have the floods that we've, we've had in, in, in the past. Um, today, our approach is, is going to be different, and I'm talking on behalf of the BC government, not on the government of Canada. Um, we recognize that there was no consultation, and we recognize that there needs to be consultation, that everyone has a stake in the region and should have a chance to participate in the future of the treaty. Um, in fact, a lot of consultation has taken place already. 
Um, the government began consultation, the former government, in 2011. And in 2012, 2013, there was considerable consultation throughout the basin. Um, they had uh, workshops, conferences, they engaged on uh, Line, they had uh, Facebook, Twitter, uh, e-newsletters. And the, the feedback that came back um, is everybody agreed with the general direction the government was going on, but everybody agreed that there needed to be more consultation, that basin residents needed to be heard, that uh, First Nations needed to be heard, and uh, everybody wanted to continue to be engaged during the upcoming negotiations. Um, in 2014, the Provincial Re Review Team formed uh, the Columbia Basin Regional Advisory Committee, which is made up from representatives of local government, of First Nations from the region, um, representatives from the provincial government, BC Hydro, and the citizens of the basin. Um, and this committee will also be providing input and feedback on the negotiations. We also have a really strong local governments committee, which was uh, started in 2011, and it has been an extremely strong voice for constituents, their constituents, um, throughout the basin. And they meet regularly with the provincial representatives, and, and they too have submitted their own recommendations on the future of the treaty. Um, we also are going to be conducting future local engagement uh, meetings in June, and we're holding those community meetings at uh, eight different uh, communities throughout the basin to ensure that once again that uh, voices of the basin can be heard and um, they're going to provide an update during those sessions on on the treaty negotiations um, a review and discussion of, of where we are how we got to where we are today and a summary of BC and Canada's work as, as we prepare for these negotiations so a lot of work has been has happened to date uh, that actually took place under the previous government and um, I was really pleased when uh, Pr Premier Horgan asked me to take on this role in addition to children and families um, and to work with the provincial review team that has been in place because the uh, Columbia Review, or the Columbia Treaty, uh, it, it's very much a nonpartisan issue. And the former minister worked with me as the, as the critic and I now work with the, um, the critic, the existing critic as, as the minister. And, and we all agree that this is a situation in politics where you need to put politics aside, where we do need to work together, and, and it's working well. Um, so I, uh, I think that it's important to, uh, to acknowledge that and, and make sure people recognize that. Um, because the, uh, the treaty is an agreement between Canada and the uh, government of the United States, um, so I want to speak a bit about our, our perspective from the provincial uh, perspective. Um, so the federal government is the constitutional lead on these uh, negotiations, but they support our interests, BC's interests, and they recognize that most of the issues are actually provincial in scope, and BC will be at the negotiating table. Um, in 63, Canada and BC signed an agreement whereby Canada transferred most of the obligations and benefits of the treaty to BC. So this put us, puts us in the driver's seat around implementing the treaty and existing treaty and receiving its benefits. And I also want to stress that as we enter the negotiations and look to the future of the treaty, the Columbia Basin First Nations in this province are partners with us on the negotiations. Um, the provincial government, as I said, has been uh, consulting with First Nations since uh, 2012 uh, to better understand the Indigenous interests and, and rights and how they can be protected and enhanced during the upcoming negotiations. And since 2016, the um, governments of Canada and BC have been meeting as a group with the Tanaha, the Shwapmem, and the Okanagan Nation Alliance. And it's nice to see you guys here today. Thanks. That's good. Um, and these meetings have been um, to clarify areas of interest and, and concern and to discuss First Nations' role leading up to the enduring treaty negotiations, including um, their desired outcomes for their nations. So our government is, consider, is committed to true and lasting reconciliation and with the Indigenous people in British Columbia. And last week, we uh, released a set of draft principles to help guide all public service as we build relationships with Indigenous peoples based on respect and rec recognition of inherent rights. And the principles do gu guide our implementation of the uh, United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, and, as well as the Truth and Reconciliation calls, uh, Commission's calls to action, and the recent directions from the courts. 
So these principles do reflect our government's desire to renew its relationship with Indigenous people in BC and to achieve a government-to-government -government relationship based on respect, recognition, and exercise of the Aboriginal title and rights and to the recon reconciliation of Aboriginal and Crown titles and, and jurisdiction. Um, in fact, in my ministry, the, my other ministry, my other hat, I'll talk about it briefly, children and families, we've just uh, tabled and, and have had passed, it'll get royal assent the end of this week, legislation which allows us to begin the discussion, to actually uh, begin the, the transfer of jurisdiction of child welfare to, um, to the various nations across the province. And I'm really very happy to be and proud that we are working very closely with uh, uh, Chief Christensen and, and the uh, Shawinigan Nation because I think it's really important that uh, we can do that as a, as a provincial government and, and to recognize that ultimately the jurisdiction of child welfare needs to be under the, uh, the rights of, of the First Nations in BC. So we are uh, continuing to work uh, within our engagement with the First Nations and in, uh, in fact the the consult consultations have been uh, quite comprehensive. Um, in fact, I think that uh, our team has been meeting every two weeks with the, with the First Nations in the last uh, three months since, uh, yes, she's shaking her head, yes, um, to ensure that those discussions take place. Um, and our government has uh, supported the, the discussions and the decisions being made um, with emphasis on the, on the key priorities during those, uh, those discussions. But as we enter on uh, negotiations, um, we need to make sure that uh, there are equal benefits on both sides of the border. Um, I know there was some discussion, I think Barb actually talked about uh, the fact that uh, you know, some Americans think we're getting too much money and, and uh, some Canadians think we're not getting enough and, and that there's issues that have to be looked at that haven't been looked at, uh, the fish, the ecosystem, tourism, uh, the water levels on our side of the river. Uh, sort of the uh, side of the border. And we do need to recognize those ongoing impacts in the BC Basin. We need to uh, know that um, uh, we need to have the uh, uh, ability to mitigate those issues. Um, I think that uh, it's, uh, you know, we just have to look at uh, what happens in the summer. If, and for those who've been in the basin, we'll, we'll know it well, but uh, the upper lakes is, is, uh, gets pretty dry in the summer and uh, the uh, Roosevelt Reservoir is always up. It's always full, at full pools. So when you're looking at uh, tourism in, in our region, you can see the concerns. Uh, when you're looking at agriculture, um, our basin had, uh, especially in the uh, Arrow Lakes Basin, had one of the uh, potential for being the third most productive agricultural uh, portion of BC. Um, it doesn't now, that land's flooded. Um, and it will never be a prime agricultural la uh, base uh, again. Uh, across the border, there's uh, consi considerable uh, agricultural benefits by the uh, irrigation that's provided by the Columbia River. Um, there's considerable benefits that are b provided by the treaty by um, uh, transportation. Uh, the fact that uh, they can transport uh, logs, they can transport uh, a grain um, from, okay, five minutes, grain from uh, uh, Idaho right, right to the uh, uh, Vanport, uh, right to, the, um, to where uh, the border, uh, Columbia River meets the ocean. Um, we can't do that in, in BC, and, and I often think, can you imagine the difference in, uh, that uh, transportation in, would be in this province if we could transport coal from the uh, East Kootenays right to the, to the uh, Pacific Ocean, what a difference that would make, or agriculture. You know, like you think of the difference of uh, what could happen in BC that, that can't happen. So it's, um, there is some considerable differences, and, and um, the bottom line, though, is, is that we need to ensure that uh, there's a, that it, it has to be a win-win operation on both sides. Um, I think now, especially with the, uh, I think Barb discussed it, the issues around flood control and the fact that in uh, 2024, uh, um, that ends for the, uh, um, the, the Americans. Um, and they do need to renegotiate that with us. That's not part of the Columbia River Treaty. And so if they want flood control, they will need to negotiate that with us and they will need to provide with some kind of reciprocal uh, agreement. And for most of us, we feel that's some kind of financial agreement. But uh, they will need that in order to, um, I mean, you might have seen uh, the potential of flood control in Portland uh, last year and, and this year as well. And uh, they know uh, that they need our flood control 
to enable their areas not to be flooded. So there, there will be discussions that need to, to be taken under, under advisement. But um, ecosystems are currently and, and will continue to be uh, an issue, an important consideration in this treaty. Um, and the Columbia River, River, Columbia River Treaty Review Team has been exploring options to enhance this and, and to ensure that the health of the ecosystem is a priority. And uh, it has to be work that's science-based, and there's a number of scientists that are involved um, from First Nations, from locals, from local government, from, the go from provincial and federal government, who have been working hard to develop and describe the ecosystem's objectives and performance measures to evaluate different options for what the treaty could look like in the future. And the same type of work has been done in the United States. So we have heard clearly that the recognition of the ecosystems needs to very much be a part of the treaty. And I think that it's, it's important to acknowledge too that around the, the question of salmon reintroduction. Um, we recognize, um, our government recognizes that this is a very important issue and we wanna talk about it. We also recognize that this is an issue that needs to be led by, by Canada because it was the government of Canada who when the um, um, Grand Coulee Dam was built in the 30s, uh, the, the American government actually approached the Canadian government and said, is it going to be an issue to people in the basin? Is it going to be an issue to First Nations? I don't know if the American government in the 30s would have asked that, Wayne. Do you think they would? I don't think they would have. But, you know, would, would the people of the basin, would they care if the salmon is, is prevented from coming? And the government of the day, the Canadian government of the day said, oh, no, it's not an issue at all. So we think that the Canadian government needs to accept that responsibility and work with all of us to do what we can to return the, the fish to our, to our region. So we are playing, playing a very, very supportive role in that issue. Um, another issue which was raised was um, uh, climate change. Um, well, the BC portion of the basin is only 15% of the entire watershed. It delivers 30 to 45% of total flows depending on the annual snowpack. And the climate change models, uh, they predict that the BC portion will have about the same total inflow, less snow, more rain, but the lower Columbia in the US can expect earlier snow melt and 20 to 40% less total annual inflow. So on top of this unpredictable extreme rainfall events, we'll add to the challenge of managing uh, reservoirs to minimize floods. So the US, Colum the US side of the basin is expected to have hotter, drier summers and multi-year droughts. And this will have a significant impact on the U.S. efforts to recover their endangered salmon populations, as well as affecting their municipal and industrial water supply and agriculture. Uh, water storage in reservoirs can help mitigate low water conditions in B.C. and the U.S. And I've already talked about some of those issues, and we talked about some of the floods. And I think it's important to, to remember that um, when the um, called upon flood control when it, when it switches to uh, called upon in uh, 2024, um, I think it's important that uh, the U.S. recognize that uh, this is incredibly important to us. And, and they do. They, they do recognize it, and they recognize that it's part of the process and part of the ongoing treaty. So um, I think that, uh, as I'm getting my wrap up. Oh, he just, oh my God, he just did this, Ed. My husband stands at the back of the room when I'm giving speeches, and when I've talked too much, he goes like this. This young man just did this to me, hon. So, again, good job. <laughs> you didn't get that sign, Wayne. Um, again, it's, um, we want to make sure this is not a win-lose. Um, we want to ensure that uh, voices are at the table that need to be heard, um, including First Nations, including the resident, Basin residents, and they were not heard in, in the 60s, and we need to ensure that those voices are heard today. And right now we have a, a small group of, of professional negotiators that are at the table negotiating for us. And a lot of people have asked uh, when I'm leaving for D.C., I'm not going to be at the table. Um, it's uh, None of the politicians are going to be at the table. It's going to be... Uh, it's professional negotiators who've been working on this for many years, and we want to make sure it's a win-win for everybody involved. So, thank you. So, uh, so before we wrap up for the coffee break, um, to your task, one is that Mr. Conroy, she's mentioned, has got duties in the house, so she won't be here for the balance of the day. I believe you're coming to the reception tonight. Try. Yeah, at 5.30, but... So this is the only chance, if anyone has got a question directly of the BC government, this is your only chance. So, 
Sorry for all the questions that actually needs to be through the microphone so it can be captured on the webcast. There's a mic there, but, no, but there's no mic. There's no mic. <laughs> That's a virtual mic. <laughs> So I was, uh, the question was, given BC's commitment to UNDRIP and, um, and reconciliation, I'm wondering what role or what measures you can take in putting pressure on the Canadian and American governments to make sure that uh, First Nations are present at the negotiation table. So is this on? Can I talk on this? You can all hear me? Um, okay. So it is the Canadian government's decision, uh, and they've made that decision, but we have been very clear that uh, the f three First Nations will be involved in discussions and have been involved in discussions since uh, 2012. And, and uh, we will continue to ensure that, that those voices are heard at the table. Any other questions? So uh, if people, um, questions come to people's minds, you've got a card in your um, kit for the day's me meeting. So please uh, write them down and write your name and submit them to one of the organizers and uh, we'll have an opportunity to uh, answer, uh, deal with questions at four o'clock onwards in the afternoon. So I'm gonna wrap up uh, today's session. I just wanted to make a couple of overriding comments. One is I think we, the whole purpose of this session was to talk about, sorry, do you have a question? I do, Go. I was trying Go to find a microphone. Um, it's actually the same question. I just wanted to reiterate it. It was pretty, uh, ironic or hypocritical or contradictory or something. Thank you for your comments, Minister, first of all. Um, last week to read the draft principles of reconciliation and then in the very same week to hear that these nations are being excluded from the talks. And so I do think that the BC government could do more to um, not just be consulting with the nations and trying to bring forward their voice, but actually be lobbying the Canadian government to get those nations a seat at the table. And so I just wanted to reiterate the question to ask if there's anything more that the BC government could do to help make that happen. Thanks. So the, the purpose of this session was really to answer the question, what's the uh, issues around the Columbia Treaty? And I think it's fair to say that in the presentations this morning, we found out there's a new burst of energy around the Columbia and based on the uh, opportunity to renegotiate. And Bob Cousins pointed out the history and the current uh, issues and how they're being addressed. And um, the role of the IJC has been fundamental in the past and I think it potentially has a role in the future. Um, Chief Wayne Christian did a very passionate and eloquent speech about the role of the First Nations and their engagement in the process and the need to be continue to be engaged formally in the negotiations, plus some of the principles around which First Nations have to be engaged. I think the most uh, telling points, one, one is that there's only one water and the Columbia is one system. And secondly, that the, uh, the three indigenous nations in Canada are now being brought together as a common, in a common attempt to start to deal with their interests as a joint group rather than individually, and that'll be, make their voices much more powerful. And finally, uh, Minister Conroy, pointed out her passion around the Columbia, her engagement in the past and her commitment to a win-win situation. And I have to say, from my knowledge of her working, she has a lot to um, offer in that regard. So I'm glad that she's on this file. So thank you for your attention. Um, you can have a 15-minute coffee break and I'll pass it over to the organizers at about quarter to 11 to come back and start the next panel. <laughs>